is pleased to have Professor Hyman Minsky as our distinguished resident. Our decision to invite Professor Minsky rests on two considerations. First, economic theory is more than a means to confuse students. <laughs> Although this is certainly a consideration. <laughs> Theory should shed light on understanding should shed light on understanding actual problems and processes, with a view towards formulating policies towards resolving those problems. Ultimately, the goal of economic theory should be to alleviate the material causes of human suffering, or in the words of George Bush, to create a kinder, gentler America. <laughs> The second consideration stems from the observation that economic ideas are too often inaccessible to the general public. In part, this is because of the esoteric nature of economic theory. In part, the lack of intellectual curiosity on the part of the public. Economics originated as a branch of moral philosophy in service of governments and people alike. In a society in which government at all levels consumes one-third of gross national product policies must and will be made. And these policies will be based on some vision of how the economic process works, even if that vision is fundamentally wrong. Professor Minsky received a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics from the University of Chicago, a Master's degree in Public Administration, and a PhD in Economics from Harvard University. He has published over 100 articles and written numerous books, including John Maynard Keynes, can it happen again in stabilizing an unstable economy? He is Professor Emeritus of Economics at Washington University. Prior to his tenure at Washington University, Professor Minsky taught at Carnegie Mellon University, Brown University, St. John's, Cambridge, Harvard, and the University of California at Berkeley. He has served as consultant to the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. He has served on the board of directors and advisor to the Mark Twain Bank Shares. Professor Minsky is currently at the Jerome Levy Institute at Bard College. The central thrust of Professor Minsky's scholarship has been to understand the financial and institutional underpinnings of economic instability, the recurrent cycles of prosperity and recession that plague the capitalist system. Thirty years ago, most economists believed that the problem of economic instability had been solved. Minsky alone cautioned that the manner in which investment is financed necessarily generates instability. Events have vindicated him. The credit crunches of 1966, of 1970, 1974, 75, 1979, 1980, 82-83, the failure of Continental Illinois Bank in 1984, the leverage buyouts of the 1980s, the stock market crash of 1987, the savings and loan fiasco of 1990, and so on, point to a financial system that is unraveling. In addition, we have witnessed over the past decade dramatic increases in consumer, corporate, and federal debts. The disastrous fiscal policy of the past decade has tripled the federal debt in less than 10 years. This, combined with the monetary policy of high interest rates, has led to an interest payment on the federal debt that now exceeds spending on Social Security and national defense. In brief, recent events make Professor Minsky among the most important and relevant economists of our times. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Professor Hyman Minsky.
and John Watkins, and since I, I commend them. The problem of the financial structure and performance of the economy has been with us since the birth of the Republic. Alexander Hamilton, our first and great Secretary of the Treasury, thought it vitally important that the federal government assume the state debt because the federal debt was viewed as an unifying effect upon the economy. He also created the first bank in the United States. <coughs> and we all recall that part of our history that dealt with the second bank of the United States, the conflict between Biddle and Jackson, and then that mysterious period to all the era of wildcat banking throughout the United States, where my home state, as is typical of my home state, never did get it right. I come from Illinois. <laughs> so long before the modern era of corruption in the city, Illinois experienced corruption in the country. Now, and then we went on to the National Banking Act, the unified system, which lasted the dominant act banking system for 50 years. And then we went on to the Federal Reserve System, which was supposed to correct the problems of business cycles and instability forever and ever and ever. And it did for about 10, 12 years of peacetime until up went the Great Depression. First the us. In October of 29, of the stock market, and then a process of decline with many recoveries, decline with many recoveries that lasted 42 months. 42 of the 80 of the 48 months of Mr. Hoover's term in the White House for the economy was sinking. Until finally, in the winter of 1932-33. The American economy collapsed. We are witnessing, have been observing, have been noting the collapse, the implosion, the decline of the Soviet Union and its satellites. But very quickly, into a well nigh chaotic situation. In the winter of 1932-33, the same thing happened in the United States. Capitalism in America, in Germany, in Europe, in Japan, was a failed system. But, Beginning in 1933, after the bank holiday, and it was wrong to say that Mr. Roosevelt closed the banks when he was inaugurated, because many of the state governors had already closed the banks in their states prior to that. <coughs> so he wasn't, he just finished it off, you might say. And we started anew with a banking system whose liabilities were guaranteed as being sound by the federal government. The ones that were allowed to all reopen, many never did, of the banks that went into the Great Crash. Both. And we put in place in the next four years, between 1933 and 1936, a financial and economic system which served this country well. which served this country well and gave us what in retrospect we will call between, gave us between 1946 and 1970 or so, what in retrospect we can consider not a golden age, but a practical best. A practical best means that there are imperfections, things go wrong, 
but that's the nature of human beings and human society. But all in all, we not only had year after year <coughs> substantial real economic growth, but the benefits of our economy were more widely and equally and fairly distributed than ever before. And then that began to unravel. As John pointed out in some early articles, I pointed out that during the period 1946-1960, the trends in the financial structure were of the kind that we had seen in the 1920s. But I also argued that we were far from the type of indebtedness situation that we'd been in the 20s. And I also argued that we did not know the power of the institutions that had been put in place in the early 30s, which were designed and aimed to prevent the recurrence of a 2933 again. We must not forget that we are the legacies we have inherited. An economy that had a history a failure which was transformed into success. And that, like all human institutions, success is very transitory. And you have to be aware of the nature of the beast, the nature of the economy. You must not suffer from illusions about what it is that makes our type of economy function if we are going to be successful in harnessing its powers for the betterment of our people. Sounds almost like a campaign speech. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not running for anything. <laughs> not a day goes by now without our reading in the Wall Street Journal, or in the New York Times, or in our daily press, or hearing it on CNN, or NBC, or whatever else you want to listen to, about another financial institution in trouble, another leveraged buyout in trouble. We can take the famous names in American history, Westinghouse, that being in the poll, Citicorp, is it or is it not bankrupt? That's the question every day. Not long ago, I received a phone call from a worried friend on Wall Street. Is Chase going to open, it was on a Friday, is Chase going to open on Monday? What are you talking about? We had some gossip about some, some deals unraveling. What is it that's going on? We found that we have on the desk, on the table of Congress, going through Congress, a reform of the financial structure. There's an old slogan, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What is it that they're trying to fix? What is it that's broke? There are some things that are clearly broke in our economy. Clearly. And have to be fixed. And only Congress and the President can fix it. There are other things where we may be taking the wrong path. And we haven't thought through what we're doing. And I want to talk about that as we go on. Now, for 40 years, after 1933, we lived in an essentially tranquil world. There were credit crunches here and there of a special kind, different from the credit crunch we have now. Now, we'll talk about what a credit crunch is as we go along. But then, beginning in the middle 70s, maybe with the Franklin National Crisis for the first time, you had a series of bank failures around the country. Maybe with the Penn Central fiasco a little bit earlier, in the middle 60s, where for a while it looked as if the commercial paper market was in trouble. But then, with increasing frequency and with greater impact, we had more and more of the financial structure going under pressure. Why? That's what we're going to Now, the third thing we have going on right now is what's going on in the Soviet Union and their former satellites. 
they are trying to construct out of whatever they've inherited from the 70 years or 50 years of Soviet communist rule, but they want to create a market economy. But they, creating a market economy requires, first of all, that you create a financial system. And to create a financial system in a society where they were barred from thinking about interest rates and present values and future returns for 70 years is going to be difficult. But where there are no clear property rights, it's going to be very difficult. And that problem has been avoided so far in the discussion of what's going on. I just did a Magellan between August 7th and October 7th. I went around the world. I ran around the world because people were concerned about credit crunches, and many times they're concerned about credit crunches to the phone. So we, and I discovered we are not alone. In New Zealand and Australia, they were concerned about credit crunches. In Turkey, they were concerned about credit crunches. They're trying to restructure the financial institutions and privatize some of them in Italy. And I often wondered why they want to do something like that, because it doesn't seem to be, they don't seem to be broke in the same sense as we are. I want to talk about what financial structure is. In order to understand the financial structure, the fundamental concept is a balance sheet. A balance sheet lists the assets on one side and the liabilities on another. But the liability in a, in a in our economy, for all practical purposes, the productive capital assets of the economy, aside from what the government owns, are owned by corporations. So one place to start this analysis of the financial structure is to start with the idea of a corporate balance sheet in which the goods, the factories, the machinery, the inventories, stores, hotels, which are empty, the empty office spaces around the country, are all listed and put a dollar value on it. And then on the other side, you have liability. The liabilities consist of debts and ownership interests, or equities. The liabilities go to another balance sheet. They become assets in another balance sheet. Every time you do something in our economy, you have to affect at least four balance sheets. You add an asset, add a liability, add a liability. As a liability becomes an asset, you have to change something on the other side. So you affect four balance sheets. In a simple world, there'd be the balance sheet of the household, families, our balance sheet, personal balance sheet, and there'd be the balance sheets of the corporations and all of the corporation liabilities would be owned directly by some household, but we never lived in that. In between the households, and the ones we, the people, as you might say, and the business organizations on the other, there's a structure of financial intermediaries, banks, savings and loan associations, if any of them survive, credit unions. Insurance companies, pension funds, mutual funds. <coughs> and you find that sometimes you get convoluted so that the liabilities, the equities of equity liabilities of banks are owned by pension funds. And so, so you get a convoluted structure. And of course, foreign assets and foreign ownership of American liabilities are all part of the problem. Part of the situation. And so what we, the people own, are increasingly not the direct ownership of business, but we have positions and financial intermediaries. We have constructed over the past, let's start in 1933, between 1933 and 1991, we have constructed a people's capitalism, a popular capitalism 
where more families have a significant positive net worth than ever before, higher percentage than in almost any country in the world. But the private net worth of most families consists of the equity in the home, and one of the most successful things we have done over the past 60 years was create a nation of homeowners. And one of the other things we did, the other part, is interest in a pension. Then, if you have private, a portfolio beyond that, maybe a savings account, maybe a bank account, it's in a mutual fund. Only rarely do we have, in fact, most of these are rich people, private ownership of equities or bonds in the portfolio. So the people's capitalism that we've had here has a new facet. The new face is the money manager, the people who manage the portfolios of the insurance company, the people that manage the portfolios of pension funds, that manage the portfolios of your mutual fund, the Fidelity, Dreyfus, Vanguard, or whatever family you belong to in these family of funds. Uh, I'm very, I am very important to all academics who are involved in TIA prep because of one of my students, the president and chief executive officer of TIA prep, the largest of these pension funds in the United States. That's John Fish. Now, what we have is this complex, convoluted stuff. In 1929, 33, The asset values of banks and other financial institutions fell. Just like asset values of banks and financial institutions are falling now, when we have this vast array of non-performing assets. And what happened is these both these declines in asset values were transformed into repudiation, non-payment of their deposit liability. One of the things that was done in the 1930s was to say that for the ordinary household, the working man, that sort of passed through from bank losses to losses on their assets, on their deposit assets, should not occur. And deposit insurance was put in place. We're talking today, 1991, about the great burden of deposit insurance, how it's becoming a large part of the bailout and cost to the government. But deposit insurance is doing the job it was designed to do, on a scale it was never imagined it would have to do it, which is that there has been no loss by any deposit in any of our banks and financial institutions of the availability no significant loss, of the availability and the value in dollars of his deposit. That hasn't happened. And one of the reasons why a situation that is fraught with danger hasn't actually led to catastrophe is because that pass-through hasn't happened. Now, we know what a financial structure is. Now, when we ask about the financial system, when we ask about creating a new financial system, we ask about what Congress is doing, we should ask, what do we want our financial system to do? What is it, in fact, that our economy is? And here becomes an issue that's dividing economists that really is a struggle for the distance. And that is, can we rely upon the market mechanism to achieve that which we want our economic system to do? It is not popular today to quote and cite Maynard Keynes. He has lost some of his uh, value in the marketplace of ideas. Being an iconoclast, I will break with today's routine and 
take as this text for the rest of my statement a citation from Maynard Keynes. The citation is follow. And see how my, well it sums up what our problems are today. If I may be allowed, says Keynes, to appropriate the term speculation for the activity of forecasting the psychology of the market and the term enterprise for the activity of forecasting the prospective yield of assets over their lifetime. I'll come back to that. Over their whole life. It is by no means always certain that speculation predominates over enterprise. As the organization of investment markets improves, the risk of the predominance of speculation does, however, increase. Speculators do no harm as bubbles on a sea of enterprise. But the position is serious when enterprise becomes the bubble on a whirlpool of speculation. When the capital development of a country becomes the byproduct of the activities of a casino, the job is likely to be ill done. Now, what did we have in the last decade on Wall Street with the leverage buyouts and takeovers? The games that were described in Barbarians in the Game. What is it that they did when they increased the indebtedness of RJR Reynolds and uh, Nabisco? What did they do? They constrained the funds that were available from internal operations for the progressive development of the technology of making Oreos or Winston cigarettes or whatever else they make. We make the technological improvement for production of shredded wheat was lost as they increased the indebtedness. Now, the other thing that happened, and this is the difference between enterprise and speculation. This is what happened in 29, 28, 27 in the stock market boom. You can get returns from owning an asset two ways. One is the asset can yield dividends, can yield interest, can then be repaid, or the asset can be productive and yield profits in the market if it's physical asset. Or alternatively, you can buy it for $5 tomorrow. When the aim in buying assets comes the appreciation of the asset in the market, then the capital development of the country, which depends upon the prospective cash flows and how you're going to earn it in the market, is likely to be ill done. And it is the capital development of the country that is the primary thing we want the market system to do. We live in a world where capital assets, machinery, factories, robots, and so forth, airplanes, whatever you need, highways, bridges, are the way in which we produce our, our instruments, we produce our lives. We also have a labor. And it's the combination of the quality of our labor force, the willingness of our labor force to work, the morale of our labor force, the commitment of our labor force, and the technical conditions of production which determine how well off we are. And in this world, today's technology, for generations now, is not going to be tomorrow's technology. And when Keynes spoke of the capital development of the country, he was talking exactly of the process of putting in place tomorrow's technology that you do today. And today we live with the legacy of the past. And the legacies of the past are two in our type of system. The one legacy of the past, capital assets, I should say three here. Really. The second legacy of the past is the liability structure. And when the system is working normally, property. Indebtedness increases and the ability to produce and the ability to earn cash to pay on the indebtedness also. And when the system is, gets off in a speculative binge, the increase in indebtedness loses all contact with the increase in productive capacity. And when you increase indebtedness, 
more and more of the cash flow is prior committed to the validation of the debt, and less and less is left for new investment. And that's exactly what happened in the last decade. And then we have to indebtedness situations which can't be validated. And we build productive and in this game of speculation. You also have funds coming in, seeking outlets, going in to boom things that are going to appreciate in value, like commercial real estate, and then having, after the 1989 uh, stock market crash, excess space in commercial real estate as investment banking houses cut their staffs and release space. And you have a plethora of non-performing assets throughout our entire economy. And because the capital development of much of our economy was neglected over the past decades, we have problems in producing competitive output in the now global market. The other thing that happened, which we must recognize, is that the world has become much more a unified financial world. And that the same things that are happening here are happening throughout the world. But I want to go back. In response to the financial crisis in 2938, we put in place a particular type of financial structure. It was one in which we first broadened the powers of the Federal Reserve System. I mentioned earlier, we introduced the positive insurance. We began a regime of transparency in which the financial posture of our companies were to be open and clear. So when Salomon Brothers did something like bid for too much of the stock of the bond of the Treasury issue, became apparent, and they're ready to go to jail for breaking the law and paying large money. Because we had a transparency, an openness, a publicness. We also simplified the corporate structure. We eliminated holding companies and layering of one company owning another company and a third company, which both made for clarity. And then we did something, what I like to call, horses for courses. If you're interested in the capital development of the country, you need financial institutions which can focus on what you think of as the important development, the important dimensions of the capital development. In the 1930s, rural electrification. So you had a special organization, the Rural Electrification Administration, which issued bonds and financed rural electrification. As a result, we have the farms and the small towns receive electricity. We also had the housing problem. And remember Jerry Stewart, right? In what's the film? It's a wonderful life. The hero of the town. <coughs> Who was he? What was he? What was Jimmy Stewart? What? He ran an SNL. It may have been a mutual. It may not have been the owner. But he ran an SNL. The great hero of the American Republic War ran an SNL. But he only could make loans about in the first 50 miles around his home office. And almost most of his loans, 80%, had to be one to four family houses. It couldn't be land development. Uh, we had a beautiful SNL in St. Louis. Community federal, had a great franchise. People believed in it, it served the community. Many people had had their houses and their father's houses financed by community federal. Then suddenly there was a multi-billion dollar organization. The management felt that became too big for their bridges. They went down and uh, helped Big Jack Connolly put up one of these developments, and they finally got out for $50 million after they put $150 million into the project. They got $50 million out, and they thought themselves lucky. And they went bank shorts. But they didn't stick to what they knew how to do. It was a horse for course. And in the 1980s, we allowed the SNL to move out of what they knew how to do into regimes that they didn't know. The SNL story hasn't really been put in the proper perspective. SNLs 
had a limited function, and they had a limited job, and they did it. They held long-term mortgages, which they financed by current deposits. The mortgages were now 20-year, 30-year mortgages. They were put in place as a reaction to the failure of the financing structure of the 1929-33 period. As a result of the new laws, we did rehouse the country. But there was an implicit agreement that the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, would see to it that the financing terms for the SNLs were consistent with the assets. So if you're going to have 6% assets, you have to have 3% or 4% as the deposit rate of the SNL. You couldn't have 12% or 13%. You couldn't use monetary constraints as the anti-inflation rules if that's going to give you 18% interest rates and hope to keep the SNLs going and getting feedback on this. I don't know why. <laughs> What's going on? Anyway, we'll stop that. <laughs> uh, I, uh, all these things that wow on you is uh, very important for economic theory because, and very important for the analysis of our kind of economies, because the modern radio circuits prevent wows by shutting themselves off and starting up again. And sometimes you have to do that with a financial crisis. You've got to halt it by intervention and let the thing start, let start up again. So believe it or not, the wow in a public address system and the behavior of an economic system are not unrelated. <laughs> now, <laughs> the, uh, The place, the horses for courses then, involved specialized financial institutions, the splitting off of investment banking from commercial banking, the development of housing finance needs, the development of the rural, the, the, the federal financing agencies for agricultural products. With specialized organizations, which had specialized functions, and then general organizations like the investment banking community and the commercial banks, which would handle the rest of the private sector. And I think what's going on now in the reforms that both Congress and the administration are doing is really a fundamental change away from that philosophy towards a universal financial institution whose limitations in terms of geographical spread and what they can finance and how they can finance their own priorities is unlimited. And this is a radical change. It's a return to the days where you had very large dominant financial organizations like the House of Morgan and Kuhn Lowe will emerge out of it. And the question is whether we want that concentration of power. Now, side by side with the financial structure comes the fiscal structure. Over the 19, one of the other responses to the 1930s was the development of a bigger government than we'd ever had before. And the bigger government had two sides. One side of the bigger government was a series of regulations and interventions, uh, food and drug acts, and things like that. Another side of the government was resource creation. When the government intervened, and of course the West was the great beneficiary, when the government spent on dams for water conservation, water purposes, and spent on dams for electric gener generation, it was introducing new productive facilities in the economy. When in the Eisenhower administration we undertook to build the highway network, it was introducing new resource creating facilities in the economy. John in his introduction mentioned the big three in the federal 
hedging side. The big three being, one, interest on the government debt, two, social security, and three, the military. As much as we find social security and the military necessary, they are not resource creating in the same sense as the highway network was, or even in the same sense as WPA, NYA, CCC, and PWA were, the sort of alphabet soup of the Roosevelt administration that put people to work to create, whether it be parks, highways, the trails in the mountains, or walking, or what you want. And as long as we have, and we need a big government, to offset some of the variations in spending that come from the private sector, we also should emphasize that government spending must be resource creation rather than this transfer system spending that we now have. And now that the need for this massive defense establishment has increased, perhaps we should remember the purpose of our government from the days of the internal improvements of the founding fathers through to Eisenhower and then was to create resources that abet and cooperate with private resources in generating the goods, services, income that lead to the welfare of the people. Now, what we also must remember that the government is an issuer of liability. Businesses issue liability. Households issue liability. Those of us who have credit cards in our pocket as we are here can go out and spend beyond our current checking account, beyond our current bank account. And we can borrow. And there is a vast increase in household debt. But every time you have an increase in debt, every time you have a debt, what you are doing is committing future income to the repayment of that. Repayment of the interest, repayment of the principal. We live in a world where prior commitments are larger than ever before as a percentage of the current cash flow. In order to sustain such a world, we need a government steering wheel to make sure that gross profits, gross aggregate demand doesn't collapse. Now, we now have a bit as Dave Wall Street Journal, and thank you, Carol, had a chart, which I commend to you. It's a chart of government spending and government taxation, government tax receipts, in the years 45 to 90, 90. And what it shows is that between 1950 and 1975, government spending and taxing were both playing around with each other. One was sometimes like, we had surpluses, we had minor deficits. The deficits may rise to as much as 3% of GNP in the recession year, but typically they were a small fraction of GNP. And the government debt relative to the size of the economy was decreasing up until 1980. And then, 19, beginning in 1975, but then carrying on to the debt, We've had government deficits that have been 5%, 7%, 6% of GNP year after year. We don't validate our debt with taxes. That means that the quality of the American government's debt, the international market, is deteriorating. One of the reasons for the high interest rates that we have is that the best interest rate is now from an instrument which is not as high in quality as it was 20 years ago in the 30s. We've allowed our government's credit to go to Today, you hear talks about whether we can afford whether we can afford certain types of economic development measures. It isn't a question of affording. We are not resource constrained. 
what we are is will control. We lack the will. The will to tax ourselves so that the government liabilities are fully validated by expenditure, by receipts. Now when you talk, when I talk about a balanced budget and taxing yourself to pay this, this burden that was put upon us in the past 10 years, because we now have to raise maybe 240 million a year or so just to pay in the fiscal budget. So taxes have to be higher than ever before in order to have the same end product in public goods and services that we have here. This is the latest. But we have to validate that. We cannot repudiate. So we have to have an in principle balanced budget as the foundation of our financial structure. Now when I say in principle, it doesn't mean that we need a balanced budget every year. When you have a recession, as we do now, when you have unsatisfactory performance of the economy, it's fine to run a deficit. We may actually be running too small a deficit now. But when the economy is functioning as well as it did during the good part of the 80s, you should not be running a deficit. The economy has to be able, with the monetary financial institutions that we have in place, to achieve a close approximation of full employment without a massive crop from a government deficit. And that was true during the entire period of what I call the golden age from 1940s to the 1960s. It was not being propped up by deficits, but it was being supported by a large government that was creating these. Now, where do we go from here? When we have a government of 20 to 25 percent of GDP, We may have a government that's too big relative to GDP. We need a big government, but it may not need to be as big as it is. When we reconstitute the financial structure, which is what Congress is doing now, in an attempt to prevent the type of contained pressure for a cumulative decline, such as we had in 29 and 33, when you do that, the eye must be kept on the target of putting in place a financial structure not that serves the bankers, but that serves the community, that leads to the capital development of the country being done well. That is the target. Because what we are doing today is really creating the basic framework for tomorrow. And unless we think of our society, of our culture, of our civilization, as something that's going to stretch out into the future, we won't do the job of living well today at all well. So what is it? I don't have a very clear, concise summation for it. Will we have a depression? Will the barriers to the depression that we put in place hold? That is not the right answer. That is not really the appropriate question. The appropriate question is, can we put in place, out of this period of retardation, a financial structure which de-emphasizes the speculative element that was so prominent in the 80s, and which emphasizes the resource development aspect, which was lacking in the good part of the years. And in that, we need to say, not that government is just that parasite on the economy. We have to recognize that government in our country beginning until almost yesterday, played a constructive part in the development of the world. I thank you very much. I'm here to answer questions until you kick me out. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Whoever in power, I'm again. <laughs> the only surviving marks. But go ahead. Um, I guess I, I'm just not seeing a focus by the leadership of the nation currently on even giving any of this serious thought. I mean, Ronald Reagan, I don't know if he even knew what economics was, but... Um, <laughs> But I guess my question is basically, do we need a grassroots sort of movement in this country, or do we just need to shout louder? You know, one our... of the interesting things in this country, in this country right now, is the difference between the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal and the news pages of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> uh, in which the editorial pages take one perspective and the news pages take quite another. And there was a recent column about how much attention, recent article in the Wall Street Journal, about how much attention our president has paid to domestic issues. And he isn't in this. And that seems to be uh, what we bought and what we had. So you get well, well structured staff papers coming out of the White House on our bureau budget on issues of importance, but no follow-up, and uh, without support, support of people who would carry the ball, and a sort of confrontational politics with the people that will draw, draw the. Uh, put in the eyes and dot the eyes and cross the T's of the specific legislation. Congress bashing has been an attribute of the American political scene since uh, Mr. Washington was president. And uh, you know there, there, there are people and there there are protections against tyranny. It was to prevent a George III rising in this country that we gave so much power to Congress. We forget our Republican and the city. You know, uh, that's what a small R, that Republican. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, we don't count down the monarchies and the equivalent around the world. Uh, but forgetting that, uh, Congress drafts the legislation. The president though, has to push for what he thinks the legislation should be. Even on bank reform, it is spokesmen for the president to talk about what it should be. And they're threatening to veto anything that isn't up to the standards, that, not of the legislation we have, but what they propose. Uh, that isn't a uh, way to do it in our presumably cooperative joint uh, Then it's very difficult to make precise why it is that there's been this decline, not in the absence of all, but an increased dispersion of welfare and well-being in this country, and changes in opportunity. The most important thing that an economy generates is the opportunity for employment for all of you. It isn't that you want to take care of you want the poor to be able to put their effort into the system and get their return in exchange. Fair exchange is no robbery. Income by right, by performance, should be every person's right. But the conditions for full employment, the achievement of a close approximation to full employment on an over an extended period of time should be the goal major goal of federal policy, of government policy. And we have a lesson in our history that it can be done, because we did that in the 1946-1965. So that we now know that we can achieve the 
close approximation of the over, over an extended period of time. And I still believe that if the private marketing system does not generate jobs, the best program for the government is to employ people to create resources that we use in common. And in every country, in every part of our country, the jobs that cry out to be done. In our parks, in our schools, in our safety in our streets. Uh, we visited our old home in Berkeley. When we lived there, it was impossible for us to lock our house. <laughs> we had one of these houses with balconies coming in on the right and left, and over here and over there. And if someone wanted to get in, they could get in. No question. Now we go to the same house and we look at it. There are burglar alarms on the house. There. You reconstruct it so you can't get it in the middle of the And it's something that shouldn't be. And we have to think seriously about what it is that has created this deterioration in a very important part of our standard of life. We all get our standard of living two ways, in two sources, in three sources. We add more than think about it. One is what our private income span can buy. The other is what we get in common. Clean air, decent schools. Decent schools, I don't have any children that have to go to school. My grandchildren have to come to me. I don't have any children that have to go to school. Wow, for marrying that child. I have a lovely wife. I have a lovely wife. son. Uh, we were in Europe recently. She saw some wonderful things for children, and she resented that she wasn't a grandmother, so she couldn't buy it. Uh, so we uh, have to recognize that there is more to living well than what we spend and we get in our private lives. And some of the countries in the rest of the world, and rich countries throughout the world, are doing a better job than that. And the third thing, of course, is what we get from our family and the way of family life, and that's the living well. Yes? Uh, it sounded like you said we absolutely need new taxes. But on the other hand, we're absolutely not going to get it. So what, what is our future? I think we have to, as I said, if there's anything, what is wrong, really, is not a lack of resources, or a lack of ability, but a lack of will. And the belief that you can get something for nothing, that there's a free lunch, is the way in which people approach taxes. If only we would get our people to think of taxes as Oliver Wendell Holmes is supposed to call taxes. Taxes are the price you pay for civilization. I think that's the same. Well, Mondale suggested that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> Mondale didn't present himself at all that. But it isn't, see, we've had, we've had now we have 10 years or 12 years of listening to the siren call that we don't need to validate our debt with revenue. The United States was something special when its debt, when its dollars, its international debt, were used as the monetary asset by the rest of the world. But now, we're not in that position anymore. The Yen, Mark, Swiss Frank are all competitors now. <coughs> and successful We have we had an enormous advantage over the rest of the world in 1946. We had very much, very close to a greater good society in the part of the 60s. And in the last 20 years, we lost some of that. We ended up with management styles 
in our industry, a confrontational attitude between management and labor, which is destructive to productivity. You know, workers have to be one of them, have to feel a commitment. Uh, we live in St. Louis for one year. And St. Louis is a prisoner of TWA. Prisoner, 85% of the flights on the St. Louis of TWA. Apparently, you're going to be in the same role in relation to Delta one of these days. I hope Delta would be better to do with TWA than the St. Louis, because TWA is not enough to has an airline to fly the last couple of years. Because of the confrontation, time to make, between the management of PWA and their cabin. Now, <coughs> you know, the trays will come out, the food will be just as bad, but the manner in which the trays come out is an important part of how you look at the airline. Uh, we now fly Swiss Air. It's amazing. Same length of flight, same number of people. On TWA, the bathrooms are unusable after about halfway across the Atlantic. On Swiss Air, they're usable all the way across the Atlantic. Obviously, they take care of them while they flight. It's the morale of the workers that's very important. The and the confrontational policies of the last two decades have regardless of what you see on the TV, the ads, And that has to be the one. Yes? This was being done. Again, it was being done with all the money that's being paid on the debt. What is the third issue of money? What? Going back into uh, floating more debt? Uh, the money, the interest on debt, right, becomes private income. What we have done in the United States is increase the proportion of interest income to wage income and to dividend income and retained earnings over the past year. This is meant, of course, as part of one of the things that resulted from it, is that the people who own the type of income, right, type, type of wealth, that get results in the, the form of government debt, receive more interest income than ever did. And you have as a result, relatively after the older population, which has been one of the other issues. But also a large part of the debt is owned abroad. A large part of the debt is owned by insurance. And then you can also find various funds. So it goes back into the income of people. No question about that. It's a transfer. But it's not the same thing as the same income flowing back to the people when you're using that aid that to buy better roads, put the bridges in shape, etc. We incidentally, you know, one of the characteristics of the United States is how poor the highway services are today compared to the rest of the world. You made a comment about social security taxes, and I was interested because of interest in Congress as well as in America about the taxation of Social Security for our, our senior citizens. Can you comment on that and, and perhaps uh, give us your views on, on should Social Security benefits be taxed, should they be reduced, and what perhaps the impact they have on the overall economy. Also, you made a comment, sir, if I may, that uh, we should feel good about paying taxes. I think we do. I think the thing we object to is the waste with which our taxes are spent. And how can we control that or at least uh, hold up to our, our Congress uh, the waste that's going on? Do you mind commenting? Two, two things. One of the problems, of course, is people are locked in. Uh, to Social Security in the sense that the uh, present recipients, to the extent that they made plans for their retirement age, but made it on the basis of Social Security being there, and you can't change the rules of the game just because you have a bet. You know what I mean? Uh, that's a very difficult problem. Uh, one of the things we forgot is how much our health 
and our vitality of our local populations increased. And there'd be no problem with Social Security, if you were to If we still had the, the mortality data of 1935, right? Because that very few people lived to be beyond 65. When Bismarck took the 65 age for his German Social Security programs, well, he, he took it because hardly any workers need 65. <laughs> so uh, there's no doubt in my mind that given the present status of our population, if we had full employment, a 70-year-old retirement age, with five more years of accumulation, we know what kind of interest does. Anyway. My own feeling is that the funds in Social Security accumulated at 3% during all the years that they have not been marked interest. If the people who paid in and had the employers paid in had over the past 20, 30, 40 years had really been able to earn market interest rates, uh, the type of, uh, they might have done just as well as they are with the present Social Security payment. But the thing that Social Security does with no private pension can do is guarantee against inflation. That's a thing. The second point which you raised about Social Security that enables me to give you my favorite is you. What I would allow, what I would ask that I have is that we open, we open up IRAs, open in there was something that rejects to it, but it a million dollars, five million on the seat. You can transfer as much of them from your assets as you want immediately into an IRA on the day this program begins, up to a million dollars. Then you can take any, any percentage of the income that you earn and put it in the IRA, and it's tax exempt. You can take any, all the income that accumulates the assets you have in the IRA are tax exempt. But every penny you take out of that is taxed as the current income tax. So what we've done in that case is transform what the IRA potentially could do is transform our income tax into a spending tax, a consumption tax. And we have incentives to save in the tax system built in. And once you do that, we may be able to get away from the pension fund business, have the employer take the employer contribution to the pension fund and make it part of the private income and do what you want. Okay? It is not in the national interest to have a large number of very impoverished people around. So if we move that way, we would also have to increase the scope and the scale of Social Security so that the minimum income for the agent would be higher right, than the Social Security scheme, but the supplements would be encouraged through this transformation of the income tax and the spending tax. And I don't much care whether you could take a million dollars, five million, I don't care, a small number out there. For equity, you may want to say that which can go. No, I oh, yeah. Um, now, this is the follow up on the social security. No, it's not. No, 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 I don't want to. I want to go from left to right. As national debt increases, uh, and interest payments increase because of that, uh, can a point arrive where the government cannot afford to pay the expense anymore, or the interest expense? Then you become Argentina. <laughs> then well, how that affect the economy? You become Argentina. A thousand percent inflation a year, five hundred percent inflation a year. Uh, what was the? Where's the? Gail. Gail. Where's Gail? See here. How much did you give me last night? How much? I got three hundred eighty thousand pesos last night from Gail. How much was it worth? <laughs> That's what inflation can do. Okay? So what happens is, if you have a system 
where you have government spending for any purposes at all. But this is the Soviet problem right now. The Soviet problem right now is that you have a government spending, an army, military, civil service, schools, and no tax system in place. The tax system in the Soviet Union was a, value, was a complicated value added so every time they produce something, they bring taxes to the government, a mark of an out-of-pocket cost. But when production goes down very well, and sales go down, government revenue increases. Now, if you have spending, no bond market, and no place to sell government debt, right? If you have spending and no revenues, how do you spend? You print. And of course, the Nicaraguan peso, to use a phrase from American history, is not worth a continental. <laughs> right? You know? So that the story is that if the interest payments on the government debt become so large and you are unwilling to tax to pay all the current expenditures that you program in, you don't have the will to tax or the ability to tax, right? And your interest on the debt. The difference is made up in our type of economy by selling bonds, right? But then if the banks start rejecting the bonds because they doubt it, they'll get paid, right? The new curve, then the Federal Reserve buys the bonds, prints money, and it satisfies the government's need for currency. Okay, money, bank. So that we have the alternative to taxation is the taxation for inflation. And inflation means a breakdown, right, of the capital development of the country. So the Argentina, which was as rich as the United States in 1914 on per capita basis, moved from being a developed economy to being an underdeveloped economy because of the gross mismanagement of the economy. The ability to tax and the willingness to spend. We'll take one more question. Oh. Yeah, I was, uh, the, Bush, the Bush administration seems quite happy not to do any fiscal policy to secure the recession. And uh, it seems to allow the Fed to try and fight these the monetary The Fed's been quite active in that we have no impact on the recession. Sorry if you can remark on why you think the Fed policy has been so ineffective. On the time. <laughs> that policy to expand the economy by increasing the monetary base and by lowering it, having low interest rates, was likened to pushing with a string. The reason was that there was a reluctance to finance on the part of banks. There was a reluctance to finance borrow in order to finance on the part of business. Banks are not, banks, but other institutions are not going to finance office buildings where you have 25% vacancy. This credit crunch is different from the credit crunches of earlier in the post-war period. The credit crunches of the 1960s were credit crunches that were manipulated by the Federal Reserve, raising interest rates, causing a decline and leading, decreasing the amount of lending capacity in the banks have, right? raising interest rates and causing a decrease in supply. Yeah. This time, the credit crunch is there, not because of an insufficiency of reserves by the banks, but the banks have just been burned. And they had non-performing assets. There were no non-performing assets to speak of in the 1960s. The assets were performing. The only thing is, and I lived through it and I enjoyed it. I was a 13% world and I had a six, five and three quarter percent mortgage. I enjoyed paying that five and three quarter percent mortgage, but they had banks had it funded at 13%. They were losing money on it every day. So that was the credit crunch then. This credit crunch is that the mortgage is on. So Bankers know that they made mistakes in judging the quality of credits that they had done in the past. 
they recognized that they were fallible. And when you recognize that you're fallible, what are you? More cautious. The risk premiums are higher. And there is no way Greenspan, Mr. Bush, or anybody in between can create optimism by talking it up and create a willingness to rush right ahead and acquire rope asses that you think of are low grade, right? Because the president doesn't do so. Remember, if any of you go into banking, and I hope you do, that's a good business. You shouldn't get rich as a banker, but it should be good. Uh, if you go into banking, remember, first question, Right. So any credit analysis is how are you going to repay me? That's why when you get a house, when you get a credit card, you have to describe your incomes. That's why when you get a mortgage, they want to know your employment record. That's why when a business firm comes up with these pro formas, right? And which you present to the banker, which is a scenario for repaying you. And of course, the banker has to be a specialist in raising his left eyebrow and saying real. <laughs> the banker has to be the skeptic and say real. You're going to do this, you're going to do that, aren't you being optimistic here? Right? Now what happened in the 70s and the 80s, the bankers bought in like, to the performance of the entrepreneurs and they forgot Bill Janeway's first law. Bill Janeway's first law was a venture capitalist financier of Wall Street, understood. And Bill Janeway's first law is entrepreneurs law. <laughs> <laughs> Minsky's corollary to Janeway's first law is that bankers lie also. <laughs> So what you have to do as a banker or businessman is cut through the web of self self deceit that often comes on the form to get a hard note, realistic picture of what the prospects are. And today the banking community, the business community is saying that the prospects for decline in gross profit flows are so good that many of the projects that we would have accepted five years ago don't pass the test. And there's no way Mr. Bush or Mr. Darman or Mr. Greenspan can get a self-respecting banker to hazard his net worth on their system. And uh, 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 any others? Thank you very much.